Um, good evening, everyone. Hi, it's uh, really lovely to see so many uh, few uh, familiar faces here. My name is Kathy, and I'm the co-founder of Arts Equator. And with me is uh, Linda, who is a curator and researcher from Vietnam, and Katrina Stewart Santiago, who is an art and culture critic from the Philippines. We, the three of us, have been working on a research project called the. Southeast Asian Art Censorship Database for the past 15 months. Um, we launched a project in 2022. Uh, it's a collaboration between Five Art Center and Art Equator. So yesterday we actually launched the, the findings and um, you can actually, you can, you can check the reports and some of the statistics and data that we pulled, for, uh, we, we pulled from the research on our website. I'll share the QR code later. But um, today we're here. First of all, I have to say, you know, it's an absolute honor to be sitting with this beautiful and important and historical work by Nirmala Dutt behind us. We don't take it lightly to be in, this, in the presence of this work, how historical it is, um, both as a, the work of a woman artist and the work that was already en engaging with issues of the environment and um, global politics in the 1980s. Um, in the kind of blurb that we, we drew up, we talked about using it as an entry point. So we will be talking about some cases from Vietnam and from uh, the Philippines. And if there's time, then I might raise one or two Malaysian cases, which you will all be familiar with. But before I do that, if I can just take a few, I have a few slides <laughs> to share about our censorship project, um, because I think it might be of interest. For those of you who were there yesterday, I apologize because I'm probably going to make the same jokes. So, <laughs> lucky you. Um, <laughs> I did make some jokes, what do you mean? <laughs> um, so the research was, um, you know, it's for the, the reason that we started the project was that for a long time, arts and cultural practices in the region have been prescribed and have been attacked in different ways, whether it's by colonial governments or by subsequent nationalist governments. And it always makes the news. Or it stays in kind of, you know, institutional memory, we talk about it. But really, there's not one place where it's documented and it's free access where people can kind of um, access it. I mean, just personally, having been in the arts for a long time, I, I often kind of get young pe younger researchers or artists kind of expressing surprise when they hear about a case. So that's one of, I think, the, the reasons that we started this project. But not only that, because for us it was quite important that we also created a system to monitor. So part of the project has been designing a research tool and then road testing it with blood, sweat and tears on the part of our researchers. Um, and we believe that we've actually created quite an interesting tool that works within the specific ways that arts and culture are attacked in Southeast Asia, because a lot of the monitoring mechanisms and a lot of the mechanism, uh, the monitoring kind of um, data is actually from the global north. And in fact, sometimes when I want to read about what's happening in Myanmar or Laos, I'm actually going into European or Western kind of databases to find out. So for us, it's very much a Southeast Asian centered practice. Um, okay. Now, so. These, uh, so this is the scope. This is the scope of the project. It's a pilot, as I said. Um, six countries, as you can see, and I've put the numbers of the cases there. Um, the question we get asked all the time is why is Singapore not included? Articulator is a Singapore-based charity, and I'm also based in Singapore. Um, it's nothing so nefarious. It's simply because the funding that we got did not allow us to cover research or anything from Singapore. <laughs> Sabin, why are you laughing? You don't believe me. Eh? <laughs> because Singapore, uh, out, of, out of the 11 countries in ASEAN, five points for anyone who can name all the 11 countries, um, two countries, Singapore and Brunei, were excluded from any work that we did because they were countries that are, I guess, much more, they're not developing countries financially. So that's the reason. And again, if there's anyone here with a lot of money, if you have a rich uncle, I would like to talk to you. Um, <laughs> all right, so it's a 12-year period. We initially started with 10 years, but the funder was really, I think, happy with what we were doing and gave us a little top-up 
to include the last two years. So it's a 12-year period. And those were the art forms, that, these were the, the forms that we looked at. You can ask me more questions later, but really the focus isn't so much on this project so much as an entry point, right? Um, we have a lot of data. For each case, we have 70, almost 70 data points, and we have in our database 652 cases. So it's an enormous amount of data. But for today, I just want to focus on a couple of data points. And one was that across the six countries, film, publications, and visual arts were the three top forms. Um, film and publications, you can kind of understand why. Mass appeal, wide circulation. Uh, also, both of these forms are forms that have really, they, they have got regulatory kind of frameworks that go back to colonial times and in, 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 and in Thailand from the 1930s. Um, so that's, you know, kind of in a way you can, you can kind of understand that. But visual arts really s kind of s stood out to us. Like, why was this form which is seen as much more niche? Um, why is it making the top three? Um, when we looked at the data out of the 102 visual arts cases, what we found was that 33 of the works were works that exist in the public space. So they can be, they would be described as public art, monuments, plaques, um, graffiti, sculptures, um, those kinds of things. So it's again, then it tracks with this idea of the higher the visibility, the greater the prominence, the greater the risk to the work. Um, but also I think, you know, it's possible to speculate and this is maybe quite speculative. Uh, so I'm not, you know, I, I think it's something that would warrant a little bit more research. But I think visual arts is often seen as slightly more of a lone practice compared to other more collaborative forms. When you think about film, you think about theater, uh, even music, and there is a kind of older tradition of the artists, you know, the lone artists fighting and not, and resisting and not giving in. So I, I don't know if that might be, you know, one, but we see resistance from visual artists quite, as being quite a feature in some of the data that we collected. Um, okay, so I want to kind of, you know, for, for this, just talk about um, one of the features that we kind of, when we looked at the reasons why um, works were attacked, there are many kind of reasons and many, really a, whole, a real range of reasons. Often you'd find that there are multiple reasons given for one work by different agents. So the public might say this work is immoral, the state might say, well, this is, you know, historically inaccurate. The religious authorities might say that this is going to bring harm to our children, right? So it's multiple reasons. But when we analyzed the many reasons, we've, the recurrent theme was this idea of breaking boundaries, you know. Uh, and the boundaries may be societal norms, they may be political orthodoxies, culture, tradition, religion, gender, sexuality. But the main salient point is that none of these boundaries are real. I mean, they are fluid, they are imagined, and they are highly changeable. Um, and so, you know, that kind of, in a way, comes back to some of the, the ideas that we are experiencing when we look at the cases that, um, that we've been studying. Um, but 62% of the cases that we looked at, you know, was really using this idea of moral policing. So it's a kind of umbrella term to kind of look at works that have been seen as having transgressed some idea of received morality, you know, received religion, culture, feminine behavior. For example, in, in Cambodia, um, the, uh, you know, the way that an artist, uh, a pop artist dresses becomes seen as disrespectful to Khmer culture. Or in Vietnam, um, an actress who wears a revealing outfit at the Cannes Film Festival red carpet is somehow seen as having brought shame to the entire population. So this idea of women as being, as, as holding the, the kind of, the, the idealized culture of, of, a, of a nation, um, which is then presented as something of pride, but is absolutely repressive, right? Um, comes across. Mm. And religion, of course, so faith it was really a big issue in the Catholic Church, Catholicism, so Catholicism or a particular brand of Catholicism was very clearly one of the energizing forces and a particular kind of conservative Islam. But what we notice is that when you actually look at the data, 
religious institutions, formal religious institutions, are just a, they make up a very small number of um, agents that have actually, there are very few cases where it's a formal, the Catholic Church or the bishop, the, the bishop's council or the national fatwa council has actually enacted it. What we're finding is actually, it's, it's actually um, the activation of believers, right? And it's an activation of, um, we, in society, as we live in, within our family structures, we, we know that people have different levels in, uh, of faith and different levels of practice, right? Uh, but somehow, you know, there is this activated force that believes that their form of their religion and their form of their faith is the definitive form. So again, it's this idea of a fluid barrier or boundary that they then make into a boundary that they need to police. Um, yeah, so you know, so, so the, the, the idea of, and I mean, we have data, which I really will not go into, but we have data about, um, um, we have data about the, the number of cases that involve the public, and it could be an individual, it could be a formal group, it could be an informal group, um, and it's a threat that I think is really emerging. One of the things that we've tried, well, you know, it's been very conscious of is to not kind of focus on the idea of religion because it isn't when i say that what i mean is that it's about the public first and what a belief whatever belief system they use because another thing that we're finding and that's emerging in the philippines small but significant numbers of groups that are using kind of uh, that are censoring work or censoring the artist's freedom of expression in the name of liberal causes so shutting down a work because, well, that work demeans, uh, you know, fat people or that work is, you know, is a form of cultural appropriation. Um, and we are, we are very agnostic about how we collect data. We don't care whether it's a left or a right or a middle. If you're suppressing the rights of an artist, we will record it. Um, yeah, so that's, you know, I think this idea of breaking boundaries. And I really like this, uh, this quote by uh, Carol Becker, who's a... Um, American kind of educationist, and she talks about this idea that, you know, it's, and it's true, it's not the work, right? It's not this physical material work that is the issue, but it's what we project on it. Um, and that's why, as an example, in Indonesia, there is uh, something called patong ballet, and it's this, it's really tacky, but anyway, it's this, t it's this uh, humongous kind of public sculpture of a couple, uh, outside the university, Surabaya University, and they are dressed in a ballet outfit. Don't ask me why in Surabaya they've got, you know, that's high culture, I guess. Uh, but it's from the 80s, and it's been there for 30, 40, 50 years. But it has recently become problematic. The work hasn't changed, but it's the zeitgeist has changed. And so there's, if you Google it, and there is incredible photographs of a religious group that uh, then got white cloth and wrapped it up. I, I believe that they are actually unknown to themselves installation artists. And so they wrapped it up with kind of white cloth. And then they actually, I mean, there's a crane and the, and the statue's no longer there, right? Um, yeah, so, um, and with that, I will leave, 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 uh, I'll leave it to you, Lynn. Thank you, KP. Um, hi, everyone. So actually, it's really interesting that um, my my slides is after this um, breaking boundary because um, for this performance, the uh, Vietnamese performance artist, Lai Yu Ha, she was actually breaking a lot of boundaries. But first and foremost, it was her own boundaries, her own uh, perception of her, her body. And so this is a performance piece called Flying Up by Learn uh, at the Enact 2010 at Nyasan Collective. And if you are familiar with Vietnamese contemporary art. Nha San Collective is actually one of the first artist collective in Vietnam pioneering for avant-garde contemporary art practice uh, from Hanoi. 
And um, so in ACT 2010 was led by three uh, artists and friend and curator, Bill Nguyen, who I actually had a, uh, a, an interview with, which is published on Arts Equator page. And with Nguyen Phuong Linh, also uh, an artist from Nhà San Collective, and Gabby Miller. And it, in, it is interesting because these three artists, they either study abroad, or they, uh, or Gabby Miller is actually from, uh, is um, a Vietnamese of, uh, British um, artist and curator. And so they didn't know the consequence of, 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 of um, agreeing to let you have performing this book. So when they know that Ha would strip naked in front of the public, they was just like, yeah, just go for it. Because, you know, they, 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 they think that this is normal, but, um, um, and another side note, I always try not to bring this case up whenever I talk about censorship because um, at the beginning I thought that, you know, this work has so much more latitude uh, and um, other than, you know, the controversy that it sparked because I feel like talking about, you know, how it sparked a debate um, kind of like reduced it, um, the nuance of it. but. Um, Later on, when I started engaging with uh, post um, with performance remains, and I started seeing that actually public uh, reactions and also the controversy that follow it is also can be considered uh, the remains of this uh, performance and also the legacy of the performance. And so, in this performance, Ha, uh, who was uh, she shared with me that she was actually very insecure of her body. She always wear hip. Uh, hip pads so that you know she has this uh, um, very ideal body the body that her husband really loved the, uh, she has small weight and then very uh, very you know like uh, big hips um, so for this performance she decided to start tri uh, stripping and her husband is in the audience so for me I think it's a very um, very important uh, work for her as an artist as a as a uh, as a woman, but also um, in contemporary art and performance art. Um, so um, she started stripping naked and removing her hip pads, and then she started uh, saying goodbye. This was like before Mary Kondo and and <laughs> <laughs> and and then she started like covering her body with like glue. Um, and then she she started rolling her um, in this uh, bed of blue feathers and she all she even asked um, people in the audience to uh, put feathers on her body and then here you can see that she walked towards the the bird cage where she has uh, a bird inside a cage she starts saying uh, she started apologizing to bir the bird saying that I'm sorry but uh, for making you uh, stressed and then you she opened the cage take the bird out in her hands and put the bird in her mouth. And then after that, she stand up and then she open her mouth so the bird can fly out. And that was the end of the performance. Um, uh, even though the, uh, the organizer had uh, instructed the audience to not take any photos, but of course, uh, some of the um, uh, uh, audience, they took the pictures, and a few days later, it went viral on uh, public uh, on media at the time. And so this is actually quite similar to the case of Joseph Ng uh, with Brother Kane. Uh, the media, the press, started like, ridiculing her, um, her nakedness, um, her you know being naked when her body is so ugly, and calling her act, her performance as a as a way to shock the audience. Like then there was a way to ridicule contemporary art practice in general, because you know at the time also in Hanoi there was this um, ex cop uh, performance artist who liked to do like crazy performance, and he was actually interviewed, and he was like, yeah, this artist that, you know, doing uh, um, unnecessary, like, shocking performance just for, just for the view. And um, I wanted to show this uh, video because just to see how, how dangerous uh, the work is because for the first time, where is it? Oh, here. Yeah, the next slide. Mm. I think it just needs to go. Yeah. So how about we exit?
Yeah, okay, I was just gonna show it from here. Um, so VTV is like national television channel. So growing up, this was like, before cable TV, this was like one of the three, there was three channels in total. And this was like what we see when we grow up and what most of people in Vietnam still watching now. And so every year before the turn of Lunar New Year, New Year we have this, um, national uh, comedy show where the actors they they act because um, so a little bit of context we believe that on the 30th day of the uh, of December in the lunar month um, the gods that live in our kitchen will start departing for the for the heaven to do a give a report of you know whatever have been happened in the past year, and this show is a comedy show that tends to like you know, uh, it's a, um, a satirical uh, TV show. Uh, comedy show that they cover po social political issues. So in recent years, they, um, they have a lot of uh, criticism for, you know, they, because of self-censorship. But in this year, the god, um, this, one, this guy, he's actually represent the god, uh, the, the Ministry of uh, Urban uh, Planning and Development. Uh, the theme of this, this year was uh, idol contest, so it was like, you know, a, a parody of Vietnam Idol at the time was like a big thing. Um, and so he came in as a contemporary artist and he dresses, he, uh, and he started like doing crazy thing and claimed that he was actually, um, what he was doing is performance art and it's like a contemporary art thing. Um, maybe we can't show it. But basically, he was like, uh, um, so he present he presented his performance to um, the uh, the god, um, and then um, the heavenly king and his two assistant. Uh, his two, yeah, it's fine. Uh, yeah. Um, and then at one point, one of the assistants started like questioning, like, "What are you doing?" Uh, and the guy said, "I'm doing contemporary art." Uh, why can't, uh, can't you tell? And then the assistant was like, more like contemporary crazy. So in Vietnam, contemporary art is called um, uh, đương đại, nghệ thuật đương đại. Contemporary is đương đại. And uh, they use the, they play with words, it's calling what he's doing is more like đương dại. So it's like, you're crazy. So, um, and, and he actually reenacted a part of that of uh, Ha's performance, which is the part where she swallowed a bird and then uh, opened her mouth to release the bird. And for me, that was like such a beautiful part of the performance that always uh, slipped when um, when people, when a lot of like uh, historians, when they write about cover about this uh, this performance, they never really touch upon um, and. And a few days later, um, not a few days later, but then after this, you know, media frenzy that led to the um, the cultural police crackdown on Nha San Collective, which is which where Ha performed um, the piece and also where Ha is a part of the collective, and there it was polarizing because she was uh, claimed by some members of the collective that it was because of hers that uh, Nha San Collective was, was closed down. But, you know, I would say that as a curator and researcher, I would say that in Vietnam, um, the government will have eyes on you and then they will wait for the right moment to actually crack down on you. And so what collect Nha San Collective had been doing, um, they are already under the radar and then they, the um, cultural police and also the, the government in Hanoi were just, you know, waiting for the right moment and has performance was just, you know, uh, the, was just the right moment. And Nguyen Jin Thay, um, a, a documentary filmmaker and moving image artist, um, she, for me, I think this work is a way to show solidarity to Ha and also, you know, the criticism from within the community that her shocking uh, performance made um, um, led to the closures of Nye San Collective and um, 
and here she she uh, had a installations of all Nyasan collective member eating something and then um, they have to explain what they were eating so uh, the artist statement is eating needs no explanation and so why do we have to explain why uh, why do we uh, do this why do we do art why do we make art and so I think this is just to show how um, um, the artist and also I think queen, the queen, <laughs> I'm going to tell you is the queen uh, to me, uh, show solidarity to uh, her and uh, amidst uh, controversy. Um, another case that I want to share here is really, for me is really interesting because this guy, this artist, Mai Yunin, he is like super patriotic. Um, so in 2000, uh, in 2020, it was uh, the tw 50 years after the uh, the VCP Vietnamese Communist Party victory over the linebacker two operation, uh, or in Vietnamese it's called the Binh Phu, and uh, to commemorate this uh, such a historical event, this patriotic. Um, artist decided to hold an exhibition showcasing 10 years of his pro artistic production just around this this event and you, you see how much devotion right and so when a um, few hours before his exhibition opening uh, he got the exhibition license and everything he's a part of the um, the state-run uh, artist association too a few hours before his exhibition opening uh, he was told that the exhibition has to be closed for a re-examination because, and later on um, in some of the statements, one member who uh, asked to remain uh, anonymous said that the reason why his exhibition was closed because he depicted a ragged flag and a malnourished, a very skinny, um, unhappy soldier. And so this begs the questions like why He's obviously is not like jeopardizing any political ideology here. He's not doing something that, you know, violating the moral code um, of the Vietnamese uh, culture. He's very like patriotic. So what happened? And for me, I, I start um, looking back at the history of aesthetics um, in Vietnam and I propose uh, an answer is, the, is that the enduring legacy of socialist realism. And socialist realism is differ, different from uh, social realism. Um, it is uh, the idealist and optimistic portrayal of state ideology as well as the working class. So for I, uh, in this kind of like uh, principle, everything has to be happy at one point. Everything has to end up like uh, with uh, a happy ending at some point. And the main theme of socialist realism is worker, soldier, and farmer. Um, um, this is to show that in 1945, actually be even before 1945, when the VCP came t uh, in power, um, they adopted this uh, aesthetics which was uh, quite, was um, following the Soviet Union as a vehicle to promote uh, uh, Marxist and Leninist uh, uh, ideology. And uh, a lot of artists at the time when they, they have to follow this principle. So uh, art now is propaganda. And so why did Mai Yunin, uh painting, uh, why was Mai Yunin, uh painting was um, um, censored? It, it's because uh, even though it's based on the real photograph, and in that photograph, even though the, the, the flag was, was dirty, it wasn't ragged. I think like uh, as an artist, he wanted to add this, you know, like dramatization to just to make sure that, you know, this historical event is, is really, you know, is, um, is glorified. And it just show, you know, that, that it was such a great moment in time for Vietnamese, but it's ragged. And for, under socialist realism, everything has to be perfect, especially you know the the flag and the representations of the state, as well as the the um, the, the soldier. In even in chaos, even in you know like hardship, they have to look healthy and and uh, happy and plum. We 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 are not malnourished at all. Yeah, and uh, and. 
fun fact is that even though socialist realism is not a term used in university, in, in state-run uh, university anymore, but if you are an art student in a uh, local fine art university, you have to draw, at some point, you have, this is your assignment. And the worker, the farmers, the soldier have to have, ha have to happy like working on the field. If not, um, if you, the, the teacher will for sure make you uh, paint a smile on the farmers or worker or soldier. And so now I'm gonna pass to Katrina. Oh, okay. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Katrina from the Philippines and um, I think that if you were there yesterday, then I would have um, talked about this a bit. But when we talk about the Philippines, I think it's important to contextualize that technically there's no censorship where we come from. Um, we're very proud of that bit of fact that we live in a democracy. Um, but I think that these two cases kind of highlight how in a space where we like to celebrate the idea of democracy and freedom, that at certain instances and given certain types of art making, that you will be targeted. And you will be targeted not by the usual suspects, with, which would be usually the state going against activists, for example. Um, you will be targeted by a different combination of um, agents that will ensure that at the very least your work is put into question or um, at most that you will go through a legal process. Um, these two works are very interesting to put together um, because on the one hand, both of them got the attention of the Catholic Church. They also happened a year apart. Um, Carla Sildran on the right um, did the one-off performance um, protest inside the Manila Cathedral, um, one of the largest Catholic churches in Manila. And he dressed up as a Spanish colonial era illustrado, the colonizer. And he carried a, a sign that said Damaso. Damaso is, a, is the oppressive friar in national artist Jose Rizal's No Limitangere. And so he is kind of like the the priest that no one wants to remember from the Catholic Church. And so he writes Damaso on a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a placard, and he enters the Manila Cathedral during an ecumenical event. And so all the bishops and the cardinal was there. And he walks down the aisle, and he screams one line, which is, stop meddling in politics. Carlos, the context of this was the fight for the reproductive health law in the Philippines, which had yet to be passed, had been languishing in the Senate and in Congress for a very, very long time, because those are all filled with Catholics. And Carlos was a very huge advocate of the reproductive health law. He was uh, out on the streets with activists and with women calling for its passage. Um, and so when he did this, it was really, to all of us who were watching it happen, it was him elevating that kind of protest to a space that no one would dare do a protest at. And so we all thought that it was brave, for one thing, but also that the power of that particular performance was in the fact that he was able to do it in that space. Right. Um, it was also very um, of the moment. It couldn't have been. It wouldn't have made sense for him to do it at any other time, even if he was advocating for the separation of church and state, um, because that's like a long, drawn-out discussion. This specifically was about the reproductive health law, and I think even as he did it, and we realized that the church was going to file a case against him for offending religious feelings. Um, I think there was a tendency for even those who were critical of the fact that he had done it because he had entered the Catholic Church to do it. Um, I think we all kind of appreciated the bravery and the courage. And of course, Carlos was able to do it because also of his privilege. Um, he is a, technically a mestizo. Um, and so he, we all thought he had the uh, capacity to do it precisely because he was of a certain social class that kind of felt like they could get away with things like this. Um, but the, I think the, the biggest thing about Carlos's case is that he ended up apologizing. He was actually given a warrant, of, served a warrant of arrest. He was jailed in the city jail. He filed, he posted bail, got out. His lawyers told him to issue a public apology to the Catholic Church. And so he did. And 
they pursued the case. And so at some point, the discourse became about, you know, the Catholic Church is about forgiveness. <laughs> Catholicism is about forgiving the ones who sin, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so it became this very strange, you know, this brave, courageous artist. And then suddenly, you know, trying to soften it a bit. Um, and then kind of backing out of the reproductive health law discussion. Because I think at some point he realized they were actually going to be capable of winning that case against him. And they actually do. Uh, Carlos died in 2019 in exile because he was found guilty of actually um, offending religious feelings. Um, and I think that's what makes it such an important case. Because it, I think when we look back on it, we're all actually quite surprised that it even happened. Um, and then that he had to die so far away. And that it also kind of just, because Carlos was also a performance artist outside of this advocacy. And so that kind of also stopped that practice altogether. Um, while the Carlos case was going on, uh, Medeo Cruz's Politeismo, which is the, the images you have on the left, um, a year after was... Uh, reinstalled in the Cultural Center of the Philippines. And I say reinstalled because it had, this was a third iteration. It was an exhibit, it was an installation he had exhibited before in different spaces. And it was part of an exhibition of uh, University of Santo Tomas alumni because they were celebrating uh, the university's um, quadricentennial. So uh, for context, the University of Santo Tomas um, is very proud to be a Catholic university, and the first one in Asia. And so they are called the Royal, and I kid you not, they're called the Royal Pontifical University. Okay, so, so this is a source of pride for the university, and its alumni put together an exhibition to commemorate the quadricentennial precisely by gathering artists with new and old works and, you know, showing their practices. No. Um, and so this is actually a pretty big exhibit. And, the th and it was called Kolo Boyle. And so it was obviously also going to be critical of the kind of education that they got in the university. Um, the interesting part about Politeismo is not just that it was uh, an old work, but also that it was framed, it, the, but also that its primary agent um, for censure was actually mainstream media. And it was mainstream media that went into that exhibit and then it kind of, you know how those exposés where you have like a hidden camera? And so they were, the reporter kind of did that whole genre um, around this exhibition. Like it was a secret exhibit with a secret installation that was taking a stand against the reproductive health law and therefore was also a critique of Catholicism. Um, I do not doubt that it is a critique of Catholicism, but it isn't just that. Um, I am pretty certain that it isn't about the reproductive health law, precisely because the context in which it was created long before the debates happened um, had nothing to do with the reproductive health law. Um, but I think it was that framing of an expose that really made it controversial. Um, and I remember very clearly, I was, a, I was very active writing art reviews at that time. And I had seen the exhibit. I had gone to see it because I was you know, really, really wanting to uh, cover as many of the exhibits as I could. And, and no one was there. And it was like an empty gallery, and you know the like you know the guest list was pretty empty. Um, it had been running for over over two months, and no one cared. And it only really mattered the moment there was that expose, and it came out on TV. And then um, civil society came in and started doing protests at the Cultural Center of the Philippines. Um, and then the Catholic Church weighed in, and then the President of the Philippines weighed in, and then the former First Lady Imelda Marcos weighed in. And so it became this huge thing that really wasn't about the art. And this speaks to what Kathy was saying earlier. It wasn't really even about the work at that point. It was really about how offended everyone was. And they were offended by different things. They were offended by the 
the use of the of the cross. They were offended by you know the the penises that were in other parts of the space. They were offended by the fact that it had you know all these other icons on the wall that there were like Jesus Christ. Um, images that were interspersed with I other icons of popular culture, of other ideologies, which is really what this was about. And so it became this thing where the artist could not even begin to explain himself because there was just so much criticism that also didn't really capture what was happening in his work anyway. Um, there were protests outside of the cultural center which made it very difficult for even the head of the visual arts department to defend the work because then it became about um, the public funding of the space. Um, and so in the end, they were actually forced to close down, not just take down the installation, but close down the whole exhibit. So they didn't only repress the artist, uh, Medeo Cruz and, and the work, it, his work, it also closed down all the other works of the rest of the artists that were there. Um, and then the interesting part about this particular case is when it, when it exploded as a, as a controversy, it kind of galvanized, on the one hand, the cultural sector, made it because it was a very clear act of censorship, someone coming in and, you know, uh, closing down an exhibit, which is, was very rare, is still very rare in the Philippines. And at the time, it was very rare because post-martial law, which it's, we, got our, we got our freedoms in 1986, and so post-1986, this wasn't something that would happen. Um, and so it kind of, I think, brought back a lot of bad memories for the older artists, but also for our generation of um, writers, artists, etc. It was such a surprise that it even happened. And, and this, I think, is really also because we rarely talk about the fact that um, Catholicism is all pervasive, right? And we, I think we only really feel it in acts of censure. Um, and when I say pervasive, I, I do mean, you know, the president, our senators, our congress rep, congressmen, our government is very Catholic. Um, we take pride in this Catholicism, but also I think we're all quite conservative. Um, that's really born of the kind of Catholicism that we grew up with. Um, we're easily offended by things that put into question our, you know, God. Um, icons of Catholicism. We don't question our priests. Um, we, there's a whole variety of other um, Christian religious groups that exist, and all of them are correct, as long as they are Catholic. Um, and so it's a very difficult space to navigate when you say that you have creative freedom. Um, the Constitution of the Philippines guarantees that creative freedom. And yet, there is so many, there are so many instances in which a work will offend. And it can offend in so many ways, and any person can be offended. And so it becomes a matter of who has the power to actually act on that offense, and who has the money to actually file a case against you and bring it to court. And in the case of Medeo, for example, in Politeismo, it was the Catholic Bishops' Conference of the Philippines that filed a case against him and the officials of the Cultural Center of the Philippines. And about six, seven years after the case was dismissed, but at that point, Medeo had already moved to the province and tried to build a practice elsewhere because it didn't feel like a safe space in Manila anymore. And it truly did stop his practice for a while. Um, and so I do think that when we look at, for example, this data set from, the, from our um, research, um, it's, it's important to point out that the church itself only has six cases of censure. But that's because state institutions and civil society actually do the work for the church. That's a civil society that's very Catholic. Um, that's also 
a government that's very Catholic. And so my, my, my first take on the research on the Philippines so far is that on the one hand, this is a democratic country where censorship doesn't exist. But all that really means is that censorship is limitless where we come from. I think that's it. Um, I, I'm actually going to stop. I won't share. I was going to share about, you know, a Malaysian case, but I, I think this is so much more interesting. We've talked about, I mean, what's work is very important. Uh, no, actually, I want to, because maybe I'm not going to show this, because I want to maybe, we don't have a lot of time. Um, so actually, if it's okay with you, I'd like to actually now just go into opening it up, questions from the audience, rather than I'm going to maybe, yeah, not show that. Um, so I like to invite any questions or comments from the audience. Yes, Richard, thank you. Hello. Um, my question is, uh, what are the, what's your sense of how a case, let's say, in the Philippines would resonate across the region? Uh, because earlier, uh, Lynn, you had mentioned uh, the Joseph Ng case in Singapore that took place in the mid-90s. Uh, now, that's, as a researcher, you would know that. But does it necessarily mean that arts communities are aware of censorship in other arts communities? Um, I think for me personally, I would say that like uh, in local uh, Vietnamese uh, art community, they're not aware of other countries' um, censorship at all. And that's why I think like even for me, actually, before I joined this uh, project, I was quite a villain of like you know what's happening uh, in other country. I was studying in uh, I started in Singapore and I went to art school, so that's why I came to know about Joseph Ng's case. But I mean, I always thought that then you know the Philippines was like you know this. Uh, I, um, this model of democracy, and so I never thought that you know actually they had more cases than uh, our country do. And yeah, I think maybe in terms of resonance, like I, I don't know about awareness, but I think in terms of resonance, the database allows for a very, like to me as a as a feminist, I think that the cases involving women and women artists really resonate. The realization that across all the countries, female artists will always be targeted for you know, their bodies or for issues of sexual freedom um, or for being too articulate about political issues. So I feel like if I were going in blind into the database, I'd totally look at that and see that it actually exists across the region. Um, and so I think it, it can resonate. Um, it depends really on the kind of entry point, I think, that you want to take when you go in. Um, congratulations on the database. It looks like it's going to be a really great resource. I have two questions. Um, the first one, I'm curious to hear from the researchers about what um, your methodology was like in um, well, giving, giving us the numbers, right? And I think in hearing your case studies, it sounds like, I mean, obviously it was counting, right? We get the big picture, the graphs and all of that. But it also um, sounds like it involved a lot of um, fine grain, you know, the qualitative part. So what did you actually do? Did you go into newspaper archives or were you also interviewing people? So that's one question, research methodology. Um, second question is, uh, to what extent does the state feature in how you define censorship. Um, so across Southeast Asia, you know, did all your cases, did censorship mean when the state got involved or were there also um, other things? Yeah. So maybe I'll, I'll answer the first, the, the second question. So we, we use this idea of, actually not, in fact, censorship is when we conceptualize a project, that's the name we use. But really, the terminology is more violations against freedom of expression rather than the sense of censorship, because that's quite an old-fashioned kind of term. So the state absolutely does not have to be involved, and neither does the work actually have to be actually censored. So we included you know, what's called above the line and below the line, right? So clear-cut censorship, bans, changes of rating, removal of resources, that was very clear. And it's not always the state that does it. 
right? Um, you know, it can be an art stakeholder, it can be a funder, it can be a, you know, a police officer that has got no jurisdiction but comes into a space and sees the work and actually gets it taken down. Um, or it can be the member of a, you know, the board of directors of the National Gallery, or it can be, uh, in Nirmala Dude's case, it can be, a, I think, a, a, the host or the funder, the commissioner of the, of the exhibition. Right? It's a British... Yeah, 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 you know. Yeah, 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 you know. Uh, so, so we included those kinds of things, which are very, but they're very clearly a removal or, an, or a breach of the work has happened. But we also included things like challenges, gatekeeping, uh, speech acts by politicians or even by, you know, kind of, um, you know, I mean, I would say even the artists, another artist saying, well, that work isn't really art, you know, is a form of gatekeeping. And we included it because those kinds of speech acts and those kinds of verbal kind of attacks of performances of outrage, they have an impact on the artists, they have an impact on the work, and they have an impact, you know, really on the kind of mindset, the, the kind of internalizing of fear and boundaries in the individual artists, in the community as well. And then also becomes this idea of modeling behavior, right? Because if you see that actually, oh, that's, well, that, that kind of ordinary Joe has made a complaint about this work, then I am as empowered to make a complaint about this work, right? So it's a kind of uh, multiplication, I think, of behavior. So that's it. Uh, your other question was about the granular detail. You know a bit about that. <laughs> um, so um, our methodology was like um, going back to news archives, and actually for Vietnam, is quite. For me, I felt like you know it's quite straightforward. Um, because um, at first, at first, because on the news, um, there's always something's going to be fined, something is, someone is going to be charged, something is going to be banned in Vietnam. And so, um, so for actually f publications and films, um, the information about bans are quite uh, are publicly covered, and because they are like, you know, um, the, the, the popular forms of recreations in Vietnam. As for visual arts and independent films, it really relies on the memories of, of, of people. So, or even myself as you know, a cultural uh, worker. Uh, and then I'll, from there, I will start uh, doing, um, conducting interviews. And from one interview, we will lead to another. And because memory is really, it can be um, unreliable sometimes. So it requires a lot of, of fact checking. And actually, I did mention in my report some of the cases that uh, actually, in reality, there will be more case, more than 81 cases covered, because some of the some um, sometimes um, the curators, artists, filmmakers, they they want it, um, they don't want to. Um, we uh, publicize the information; they want to remain anonymous, and sometimes it's also because I couldn't find uh, an another source to verify um, what happened because actually the our our form our our way of collecting data is really there was like 75 uh, 76 um, questions that we have to answer <laughs> per case so it requires a, a lot of like information and a lot of fact checking um, yeah so um, generally, and I speak for the other researchers, the methodology involved a lot of crying. <laughs> it's a lot of crying, a lot of late nights. Um, no, I'm, I, I think uh, we really wanted to start with first data collection, like what was readily available. And for the Philippines, that was quite easy um, because we have a free media. Um, and so I kind of had I kind of had an easier time I think because so many of the cases are actually documented, um, and because we're very also uh, I I think one of the reasons why uh, I became the researcher for the Philippines is also because I'm so embedded in the sector, and so it was very easy for me to also just in terms of memory do a you know a first set of cases I wanted to work on and then I just started doing research from there. Um, 
interviews weren't really something that anyone was interested in having anymore. Uh, as I said earlier, I think there's a tendency for us to want to forget um, when, when censorship happens. Mm -hmm. um, and that includes for the people who are actually censored. Medea is actually one of the few ones who also became very active in, in advocating against censorship. But many of the others, especially the filmmakers, kind of just, you know, okay, we're censored. And then they want to go on to the next project. And so they don't really want to talk about it anymore. Also because, you know, uh, film and television go through an actual regulatory board. And so I guess, you know, and this is me presuming things, that, and, and as, a work, as a cultural worker myself, I think that when you have to deal with the same office all the time in order to continue with the work that you do, you kind of don't want to, you know, put the spotlight on yourself, right? Um, and so I think there's a tendency to actually, there, there wasn't really, to begin with, there was no need for me to do the interviews, but also I think no one would have been willing to sit down again. Like I tried to figure out how I could get them on a podcast episode and I realized it wasn't going to be welcome at all. Um, and so I kind of also didn't want to invade um, that space they had already created for themselves outside of the controversy. Any more questions? Yes? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, presentation. I really liked it. Uh, just for, <clears throat> I just wanted, wanted to know, actually, because your um, research is based on a violation, a violation of a uh, creative freedom. So um, I'm just um, wonder what is the parameter of uh, the creative freedom? What is what what define the creative freedom itself? Actually, With it, is it in context of certain policies or certain uh, beliefs? Because um, when you talk about freedom, actually, it's kind of a never-ending argument about what is freedom is actually is it you have that kind of a boundaries in that freedom or freedom give you license to do whatever you want yeah so thank you i mean that's a that's a really interesting question thank you for asking it um i think yeah maybe do, do any of you want to answer or okay i'll answer from you know kind of as the lead researcher what we looked at we didn't articulate this even within the group actually but I mean, we looked at kind of artistic practice. Okay, so it was very clear to us that we would not be covering uh, issues of freedom of expression in the press. We neither did we include freedom of expression, kind of general freedom of expression within the political, sociopolitical space, because there are already many mechanisms that are already monitoring those. In fact, um, kind of press freedom is one of, I think, the most monitored, especially in, in, in the the bad third world, right? A lot of it's been, you know, is kind of seen as indicators of authoritarian governments. So that's one. Um, so uh, uh, maybe I'll go back to one of the slides. And we had a lot of debate about the things that we wanted to include. But so we settled on these things, right? So kind of visual, uh, kind of cultural practices. Um, but it was not, there were things that we had to kind of push in a little bit. So we, it was very clear that we wanted to include, for example, advertisements, because that is something that's not monitored, and there is an element of creativity in it, so we included advertisements. We also, uh, as the research began, things like video games began to crop up. So that's an emerging practice, and again, we included them. Um, so your bigger question about what is, I mean, I think it's a philosophical question that you're asking, really, right? What are the limits to freedom of expression? Um, Personally, I think, you know, when you think about the human rights, uh, the Universal De Declaration of Human Rights, and if you think about even, I think, the, the 2005, I may be wrong, maybe Kai can tell me, but 2005, uh, dec so there, there, there are several international instruments about, you know, freedom of expression, and they're also kind of, within all the countries that we looked at, within their constitution, there are guarantees for freedom of expression. Our scope was not to look at law because we did not have the expertise. But in, even within the Universal Declaration for uh, Freedom of Expression, there are, it, sorry, human rights, it, there, is an, there is a very clear kind of clause where it's freedom of expression, but there are limits 
when it comes to incitement. Um, I think incitement and... Um, sorry, I can't remember, but basically incitement and certain kinds of harm. And the same thing, I think, applies to a lot of constitutions in the region. And I think that's, you know, that's a really good practice. The problem, as we, we know, and in practice, not just in Southeast Asia, but across the world, whether you're looking at you know, what's happening in, in, in parts of Europe or even in, the, in America, in South America, in Africa, is that um, when you have uneven power, when you have governments that have too much power, or you have religious institutions or publics that, you know, kind of take things into their own hands. These measures which are meant to, um, to kind of, in a way, prevent incitement is then instrumentalized to suppress criticism. So there's a difference between the two. But of course, these things are subjective, right? Yeah. I think I, I can share um, like uh, more specific examples with uh, Vietnam as the only communist uh, country here. Um, you know, so Vietnam is a socialist republic country with one uh, ruling, one party that has ruled uh, since 1945, since the inception of the, the country. And um, so since then, there's only one ideology and there's only one collective, and so there's no alternative. So I think freedom for artistic expression, freedom for creativity in Vietnam means that you know a lot of time the artists who face really severe um, um, uh, challenge from the state is that they just want to explore alternatives, alternative history, instead of um, the history that, that acknowledged what happened in 1975 that divided, you know, the country, um, even though they, uh, the VCPs said that, you know, they united the, the country. And also, the late, earlier I mentioned socialist realism, for a time um, since the founding of the country, it was the guiding princi aesthetics principle in Vietnam. And artists, they wanted to explore other forms of expression as well, but they couldn't because um, even though Ho Chi Minh was good friend with Picasso, he he condemned P Cubism. He think modernist uh, movement in the West is like bourgeois art, uh, nudity is bourgeois. Um, there's a ro the rotten wood from the Western um, Western um, um, Empire. Well, imperialist. Yeah, imperialist. Yes, and this is a, a direct quote translation of the right code. <laughs> and, and so I think like over the, the years, right, what um, Vietnamese artists wanted is just to, to, to see alternatives. And until now, that is not something that is tolerated uh, by, by the state. Yep. Thank you. There was another question, I think. I, yeah. I have a quick answer. Oh, okay. um, yes. I think also that I'm going to speak to the way, and I think that kind of that question also speaks to how did we choose the cases that we were going to include, yeah? Um, and I think that at least for me, um, a major part of it had to do with, for example, the Movie and Television Review and Classification Board. Um, was I, I went through the transparency, the Freedom of Information portal, and I actually received a list of all the films that they had given an uh, adults-only rating to, which means it can't be publicly exhibited. And it's a very long list of um, foreign and local titles, but there were so many, like a majority of it would be porn films. And so Kathy and I went back in and I was like, okay, if I put all of this in, which I felt wasn't, I shouldn't do, it would totally skew the data for the Philippines because then these films are actually being done specifically as porn. They don't really want to be shown. They know they're not going to be shown in commercial cinemas anyway. They're not even going to be screened in any of the alternative spaces anyway, where you don't need a rating. Um, they're not art films. They're not going to go to film festivals elsewhere in the world where they will be appreciated. The only reason that they're actually banned is because they're porn. And so I do feel like that speaks to the question of um, what kind of creative freedom were we, were we monitoring? Um, at least for me, in that particular case, it was very clear that I couldn't put in all those films um, with due respect to the ones that were actually films that were being banned for you know, political content, 
um, for queer content, for um, a depiction of the Philippines that they felt was too harmful, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and so I think it's, on the one hand, it's well defined um, by universal de declarations, etc. But I do think that our own creative sectors are defining it every day and that our practices are defining it every day. And we do need to be able to talk to each other about its boundaries um, and how far each of us are going and why we're even going that far. We have maybe time for one more question, yes. Hi, hello. Uh, so my name is Adam, I'm a visual artist based in KL. So I think uh, a lot that we've talked about today is we're talking about uh, the external layer of uh, censorship. You know, we talk about you know the censorship agents being the state or the government and uh, religious institutions. But I think there's uh, I want to know what are your opinions on this. There's another layer of censorship whereby uh, I think artists and creatives, especially in this region, we self-censor, not as just as artists in our own creative practice, but also in uh, certain art institutions or curators or galleries, we tend to self-censor and we decide to not do works that you know might incite uh, censorship and all that because especially even in Malaysia, we have a very long history of art censorship, especially in Balaisini. So, you know, what are your thoughts on how censorship affects the creative practices of that is especially in regards of self-censorship. Um, well, if Katrina had had a way... <laughs> See the mic? Is <laughs> if Katrina had had her way, we would have included self-censorship into the database. But I think because we were looking at it from, as a, research, from a research perspective, and it was really... Um, we were interested in getting... Um, let me get this word mixed up. Qualitative. Quantitative. Yeah. We were quantitative. We wanted numbers um, because there actually are, there's a, there have been many researchers that have written about censorship in the region, but uh, a lot of the, 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 the talk around it is not really backed up by kind of numbers and data. So for us, it was very clear we wanted numbers and statistics. And we, we didn't have, at that point, the resources, nor could we come up with a way that we could realistically kind of get, get that kind of data, because absolutely it's, it's crucial. And I don't think it's an Asian problem, I mean, at all, right? I mean, let's not, you know, let's not idolize the global north, right? Um, it's, it's everywhere, but um, we, not within the scope of our project. However, because we've collected so much of data, we initially set out, the brief we gave to the researchers was baseline data, but they were very rajin, very hardworking. So a lot of the, the case studies are a lot more involved. And any researcher that goes in, uh, you know, if you read some of it, there are cases enough that you can see the artist has you know, kind of talked about it. But I think gathering data on, on self-censorship would require one-on-one -on -one interviews and some kind of methodology to kind of measure it, get them to measure it, right? Yeah. Uh, that would be an interesting project. Again, if you have a rich uncle, I would be like to meet her. Auntie. Aunties, you're right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. You see? Sugar no. mama is a thing yeah. now. Mm, yeah. Mm. <laughs> Sorry. See? My bias. Sorry, guys. Um, if, are there any more questions? Because I also... I, can I ask? Yes. Yes. Oh, I think like uh, growing up with censorship that has been practiced like since the 40s, 50s in Vietnam, self-censorship is a real thing. And it's a conscious thing. Voluntary. Uh, um, um, decision sometimes and a lot of time it comes to the questions before we decide to do what we do is is it worth it yeah so I myself get uh, censored by um, the gallery that I worked with because it was um, for a long period of time we had this uh, freedom, we have this way to work, this loophole, because the gallery was registered as a um, kind of like a family business in furniture, and so the show that we do is, is uh, it's like a part of like marketing uh, event to promote our um, 
they call uh, stuff, right? And so in our, um, and so when I wanted to do uh, an, ex an exhibition on video art and film, I was told not to mention video art and film because it will attract. And actually this, um, I realized that actually film video art attracted uh, local authorities really quickly. Uh, it happened to another exhibition that I worked in Hanoi as well. And so it, I had a, such a hard time rephrasing. And in one of the articles that I, post, um, that I produced during this research, we talk about editing as a power tool, powerful tool in Vietnam, right, to work around censorship as a creative strategy. But it's actually for me, it's an, for me, it's voluntary uh, self-censorship because then instead of like you know saying this is a, a this this is a video moving image showcase, then I have to remove the moving image at all uh, entirely because we. If we include moving image, then we have to apply for license, and the gallery d didn't want to risk for you know going um, yeah revealing uh, itself to the uh, authority after 20 years under the radar, and and so I would say that you know, but I kind of sympathize with the decision at the time because for me, um, even though it limited the amount of like. Uh, um, viewers uh, that coming in into the gallery mm. into the exhibition at a time I feel I was waving different like you know priorities my priority is that I wanted to showcase these emerging artists I want to bring in these you know uh, filmmakers and artists from different field from different period in time from different countries and so if the director let me do that it's already you know so good enough that I accepted that yeah, I compromise, and and it actually um, is the question that we ask a lot because you know, like the case with like you have, we didn't want another artist space um, closed down. So before even like me as a curator, I wanted to do something like really groundbreaking. I would ask myself the question whether I would want to um, make my co-producers or the host uh, bring trouble to them. And so it's like, is it worth it, is the question. And I know it's like, you know, voluntary self-censorship, but I still want to be in the country doing work rather than going exile, because I feel like then my activism is, means nothing anymore if I move to another country. Yeah, but I don't want to go to exile. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Lynn and Katrina. Um, Thank you very much, everyone, for your questions and for your attention. Before we close, I actually want to just, if I can just uh, introduce, I can ask uh, Sudarat Musika Wong, Dr. Sudarat Musika Wong, and uh, Kai Brennan. Kai is our Cambodian co-researcher, and Sudarat is our Thai researcher. Um, oh, okay. Bye -bye. Um, and um, to also just acknowledge the support that we've had from Five Art Center, Mark Tay. Uh, on this project, Zikri Rahman, who is our Malaysian researcher, actually had, is not able. He has he had to leave early today, but um, just yeah, please do check out our database because um, you can scan the QR code or just go to Articulator. Unfortunately, well, not for you have to register everything. All the findings and the reports are free access, but to access the censorship database because there were some security issues, we actually have asked people to register. Um, the information on the censorship database, which is interactive, you can search, you can sort, is a fraction of the data points that we have because as Lynn mentioned, we have, you know, for each case we've got 69 data points, but we've only got six or seven data points here as for a general public. Um, but if researchers are interested, then, you know, they can talk to us and we can give them access to some parts of the research as well. Thank you very much, everybody. And thank you to Ilham Gallery for hosting us. And Jun Kit, who was our amazing designer who did all of the branding and designs and graphs. Thank you. Thank you.